Joe, it's great, isn't it, to see our young people. Many of them serve at the back. We might not see them every Sunday. Many of the youth serve as part of the worship team. And I tell you, when I was that age, I wasn't pressing into God and willing to serve him. So every one of you, keep going, keep pressing on, and God's got amazing plans for you. I'm going to start this morning by taking us back to October 2012. Uh, Me and my dad, we were making a 304-mile journey to a job interview I had in the northeast of England. Um, A month earlier, I'd been made redundant along with 300 men. Um, I worked in a coal mine in my village and it closed. Up until this point in life, I lived in Glenith, I trained in Glenith, I played rugby in Glenith, went out in Glenith, I lived like I was from Glenith, dressed like I was from Glenith, spoke like I was from Glenith. Um, That's who I was. Well, cut the long story short, I got that job. It was an unbelievable package, but they wanted me to start within a week. So one week later, I pack a bag, I drive the 304 miles up there, this time without dad, and I cry the whole way. And over the 14 months I work there, I change. My Fiesta goes to a Volvo. I go from renting a house to buying a house. Trainers to boots. Tracksuit for chinos. Jumper for blazer. T-shirt for shirt. And I start flying home instead of driving home. And I become a person of my environment. I wonder what story do you have when you've become a person of your environment? See, the people we are around, they either influence us or we can influence them. And we're looking at a section of Paul's letter here, and he's writing to the believers in believers of Jesus in Ephesus. And we've just had it read out to us by Carlin. And here's my title and the first question for us this morning. Are you living differently in light of Christ, or are you a person of your environment? Are you living differently in light of Christ, or are you a person of your environment? Paul starts here. Numbers 17 to 19. And he says this, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of of greed. What's Paul telling them? Stop it. That's what he's writing, isn't he? Look, I'm telling you now, stop it. Stop living like the Gentiles, for the way they live is different. Because of their thinking, they've separated themselves from the life of God. They've closed their hearts and their minds to him, and they live in ignorance. He says they're so numb to the things of God, they're so switched off to the purposes of God, that they live every day indulging in everything this world has an offer. Their life is full of greed and their life is full of impurity. Here in these few lines, Paul reinforces to the believers, you are different. That's what he's telling them. You are different. He starts with our strong instruction to not live like the others any longer, not to become people of their environment. Look, okay, you live in Ephesus. This is how everyone else lives but you're different. Stop becoming people of your environment. Paul says that the Gentiles' understanding of God is darkened. He says they're separated from the life of God. Their hearts are hardened, and they've given themselves completely to other things. Now, that's the life of someone not living for Jesus, and it outplays itself with personal greed and every kind of impurity. I was reading that And I thought, wow, that sounds like 21-year-old Lloyd who's just had a new job. Darkened understanding of God, living separately from the life of God, heart-hardened and completely indulging in personal greed and in pure satisfaction. Now, are you different? Are you different? Do you live maybe with a darkened understanding of God? Are you living a life that's separate from the life of God? Is your heart been hardened? Do you completely indulge in personal greed or impure satisfaction? Or are you different? And if you are, what is it then? What is it that just simply makes you different? Let's see what Paul says 
to the believers in Ephesus because they should be different. And that's what Paul's explaining. Reading between Numbers 20 to 24, Paul writes this. That, however, that's not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. What's Paul say? Guys, this isn't the life that you learned about, is it? When you heard about Jesus, and you were taught about the truth that is found in him, you were taught that the former way of life they used to live, to put it off, Paul says, I told you this so you wouldn't continue to be corrupted by your deceitful desires. You were taught as followers of Jesus to be made new by the attitude of your minds. Put your new self on was the instruction for every one of you. Become the person God has created you to be, the person that will be truly holy and righteous like God. Paul, he wants the followers of Jesus and Ephesus to understand this. This is who you're supposed to be. First few lines we read, you are different. This is who you are supposed to be. A new self, not the old self, which is like everyone else, because your old self, it says, will deceive you. Become who God has created you to be, people who are truly holy and truly righteous. December 2013, this time I've got a telephone interview, and it's for a job 10,627 miles away. The last few months of flying home, living alone, dressing differently, living differently, speaking differently, it's worn me down and I want out. Cut the long story short, I get a job, it's not a great package this time, but I don't care, and they want me to start within a month. I pack three bags this time, one wasn't enough. My dad and my sister, they take me to the airport and I travel the 10,627 miles. No crying this time, just relief. I just knew I hadn't been who I was supposed to be. And during my time there, I watch, I see, and I was taught about a life lived out for Christ in the world of sport. Not just in the world of sport, lived out in every area of life. And I made a decision to put off my old self, which was being corrupted by his deceitful desires, and to be made new. I was a new self, living to be like God had created to me, me to be, holy and righteous through Christ. And over the next nine months I work there, I change again. But this time it's different. I don't become a person of my environment, but a person of my creator. I don't become a person of my environment, but a person of my creator. I'm no longer influenced by the people around me, but I'm influenced by the God that's created me. Volvo, back to sharing a car. Owning a house to sharing a house. Boots back to trainers. Chinos back to shorts. Blazer, special occasions only. Shirt to vest. Flying home to try and hitch a lift home. Boy, it was hard. Do you know what five years on it still is? But surely people should see, if I follow Jesus, I live differently, right? Surely if you are a follower of Jesus, people should see you living differently, right? In Australia, I counted the cost. I chose to deny myself and to live my life for Christ. We were singing that song just now. Forever all my days, I will love you, Lord. Easy to sing, harder to live out. But that's Paul's point. As a follower of Jesus, he tells them, look, you are different. You are called to be who God has created you to be. Your old life, clearly thrown away, and your new self is what should be on display. Now, I know living the Christian life is a process. Although we have a new nature, we don't automatically think all good thoughts, and we don't automatically express all the right attitudes. But as we keep seeking and listening to God, we will be changing all the time, continually being transformed to be more like him. Our old way of life before Christ, it should be completely in the past, to be be put behind us, like removing old clothes and putting them in the bin. 
Are you who you're supposed to be? Are you a follower of Jesus who is told you're different and you're supposed to be living the new self? Do people see your life differently in light of following Jesus? We go on to lines 25 to 32. And Paul says this, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Now Paul starts here with therefore, and like I say in life group, prepare yourself for a rubbish joke. Whenever we see therefore, we need to ask what it's there for. Well, Paul has told them that they're different. He's reminded them of who they are supposed to be in light of following Jesus. And from establishing that basis, he addresses the believers, and he pretty much goes, how about you start sorting these areas out then? You're different. This is who you're supposed to be. How about you sort all this out? Paul knows that our actions model our beliefs. He knows the struggle is real between the flesh and the spirit. Our deceitful desire is always battling against living for Christ. October 2014, I came back to Wales, back playing rugby, back to an old familiar environment. Old desires corrupt deceitful thoughts. And many people were previously hurt by my actions. There's a lot of divisions in relationships. But God in his kindness enables and empowers me through the Holy Spirit to live differently. That's, the key is not Lloyd try harder. The key is Lloyd surrender. The message of the gospel isn't do better, try harder. But it's saying surrender and receive what Christ has done for you. And through his Holy Spirit, he will empower you to live differently, and he will come and sort areas of your life out. And God gently walks with me as he addresses different areas of my life. Pride, identity, loyalty, integrity, purity, selfishness, respect. The old is gone, and the new self is here. And that's what Paul starts in line 25. He's pointing out things that through God, that the believers in Ephesus need to sort out. He says, stop lying to the people around you. Simple, I love Paul, he's pretty straight. His letters are punchy. Just stop lying. Because lying hurts people. Lying brings division. Lying affects relationships. In 26, he says, when you're angry, he says, don't sin against God. He's just saying, deal with it. Deal with the issue promptly, is Paul's advice. Now, when I was reading, he doesn't say when. No, he says when, not if. So the Bible doesn't say we shouldn't or we won't feel angry, but it points out the importance of dealing with our anger properly, dealing with the issue. See, if anger is vented thoughtlessly, again, it hurts people. It brings division. It breaks relationships. If anger is bottled up within us and it's not expressed, it causes bitterness and it destroys us from the inside. And Paul tells them, deal with it. Deal with this anger immediately, because otherwise it'll hurt people, it'll create division, or it'll make you really bitter, and it'll kill you from the inside. He says, nursing anger will give Satan an opportunity to divide. He says, don't give the devil a space of opportunity. Don't let him bring division to any relationships you have through lying and not dealing with anger. Because that's the tactics, isn't it, of the enemy we read and see so often in the Bible to divide and conquer, to isolate you, 
And Paul previously wrote this to the Ephesians. Christ is head of the church. Christ is head of the whole body, and he makes the whole body fit together. As followers of Jesus, you are part of that body, each part with a special work that makes the body grow. Grow so the body is healthy. Grow so the body is full of love. And grow so that the body is doing what Christ wants the body to do. There is unity in Jesus. Unity to be maintained by those that are the body of Jesus. And if this is who you are, cut out the lies, deal with anger. That's what Paul says. Why? So people are not hurt and there is no division in the body of Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus, stop lying and get your anger sorted. Paul goes on. If any of you have been stealing, don't do it no more. He's, he actually says, get a job. Get a job and do something useful with the hands you've got so you can start sharing with those in need. He doesn't say, look, stop stealing because you shouldn't steal. He says, no, stop stealing and start using the hands you've been given for good and help other people in need. See, everything Paul is addressing in terms of their actions is to enable the building of people. That's God's heart for me, for you, for everyone, to build us up to the people he has created us to be. When our actions don't reflect that, they create division, they hurt people, and break relationships. So stop stealing, get a job, and start using your hands for good. Stealing hurts others, stealing brings division. He goes on in 29 to 32. He said, watch the way you talk. Don't use unhelpful language. Use words, again, he says, that are helpful for building people up and are a benefit to those listening. Are the words you use building people up and a benefit for those listening? Or actually, are they creating hurt or bringing division? To the people around you. He says, don't cause great stress to the Holy Spirit of God, for it's the Holy Spirit that seals your freedom. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander. In fact, anything that's malicious, he says, cut it out. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, because God forg has forgiven you through Christ. Now, you're starting to pick up the theme of what Paul is trying to sort out in these few lines. He's not writing a list of rules that they have to live out just because they say they follow Jesus. Okay, you follow Jesus, so here's a list of things you have to do. No, Paul is helping them see and understand that every action they take either hurts people and creates division or builds people up and creates unity. Are you living it out? Are you hurting people and creating division? Or are you building people up and creating unity in the body of Christ? Is what you say helpful and beneficial for those listening? Or does your language hurt others and create division? Are you bitter, full of rage, angry, constantly brawling, slandering others? Are you being malicious in any way? Or are you showing kindness, compassion, and forgiveness that builds people up and brings unity? Paul's secret to how this is possible is found in his final few words of this section. He says, in Christ, God forgive you. In Christ, God forgive you. See, the Bible is a fantastic story. You should make it a priority to read. The Bible tells me that God has given me this life, the gifts, the abilities I have, the relationships around me, all the experiences for me to enjoy for me to live them out. But it tells me too, but I already know this, that my life, everything he's given me, all the relationships he's given me, you know, I just push God out the picture, I reject him. And one day I'm going to see God face to face. One day you'll see God face to face and we will be judged. As the Bible tells us. But the Bible says through Christ, I can be forgiven. The rejection of God, the live in my own way, being deceived by the deceitful desires of the heart, 
I can be forgiven. That day when I meet God doesn't have to be a fearful day when I'm fearful of judgment, but a day of rejoicing because through Christ, God has forgiven me. Through Christ, God has forgiven you. No hurt, no division, unity and relationship with the Creator and our Creator. God has shown me kindness. God has shown me compassion and forgiveness, and He invites me to respond. The Bible leaves us, it's good news, but it leaves us with a challenge, and it leaves us with a response to make, to accept Jesus and follow Him, or to reject Him and face the consequences. Through this old, through accepting Jesus, the old is gone, the new self is here, and if you have accepted Christ this morning, back to my title, are you living differently in light of that? I just had a feeling this morning, it's quite punchy, I know, but Paul's punchy, and I'm just saying what he said, it's the word of God. And you might be convicted, you might be someone that's accepted Christ, but you know what, the old self is on display. The new self hasn't really been put on, you're being deceived to the desires of your flesh, and you might not feel worthy, and I've been in these meetings where Sometimes the speakers preach and you think, who the heck's told him about my week? Who the heck's told him about what I've been up to? And it's almost as if there's no one else in the room but God speaking right to you. Do you know what? There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. That's the good news of the Bible. The Bible doesn't bring conviction. But when you hold a mirror up to your face, you can't hide the truth. You might feel convicted, but these words, may they comfort you. In Christ, God forgave you. In Christ, God forgave you. So you may be here this morning, and I think it might be time to put off the old clothes. You might know it's time to put off the old clothes. You might be saying, I follow Jesus, but the new you is not yet on display. The Bible tells us you are different this is who you're supposed to be, and sort this out. I want to give you an opportunity this morning to respond. Let this morning almost be like a wardrobe change. You've come in with a set of old clothes on, but you're going to leave you in new clothes, a new spirit, the new self on display for all to see the glory of what God does in every one of our lives. And we'll go into a time of worship and give you an opportunity to respond. But if that's you this morning, don't miss that opportunity. Don't miss this space to leave as the new self, as the person that God has created you to be. And you may be here today and you've never accepted Jesus. And I want to invite you and challenge you too to respond to the call of Jesus, to the message of the Bible, an invitation of forgiveness an invitation of life, an invitation of a relationship with Jesus that starts today. And may he work in your life through his kindness, his compassion, his forgiveness, making you truly righteous and holy. Would we all leave go of the old self this morning and put on the new, who Christ has called us to be, and may he have all the glory. Amen.